Good morning. Welcome to this worship service at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Willowdale, Toronto. Wherever you're watching from today, we invite you to participate in this service. We pray that you will feel the touch of God's Spirit as you join us in worship. We'll be joining in together for communing later in the service. So please prepare a glass of juice, a piece of bread for yourself at home so you can participate. Now, let us prepare our hearts and minds as we listen to this morning's prelude. Let us gather now for worship as we listen to these words from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Let us pray. Merciful and loving Father, we thank you for your compassion and grace in our lives. Help us to open our hearts to praise and worship you today, that your name would be lifted up, for we love you, Lord. Amen.
song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you and leave. 
Welcome to Kids Care Vids, your channel for discovering your part in God's mission. Hi, I'm Louise. Have you ever had to make a choice between two things? Sometimes it can be really hard to make an important choice. Like choosing a dessert. I love sweet things and there's so many to choose from. There's ice cream, there's chocolate, there's candy, cakes, cookies, donuts, brownies. There's just so many and it's so hard to decide which is my favorite. Well, I know that choosing a dessert isn't the most important choice for me to make, but sometimes it does feel that way. Now, what if I didn't choose? I could just eat all the desserts? Well, I know that's actually a bad idea. If I chose to eat too many desserts, that could make me feel really sick. Have you ever gotten sick from eating too much? It's not fun, is it? And somebody has to clean up the mess. And that's really gross. And that's a really big idea, isn't it? That our choices can have a really big impact on not just us, but on other people as well. Did you know that the choices that you make often affect others? Well, it's important that we try to make choices that are good for us and that are good for others. God cares a lot about how we treat one another. He wants us to treat others in ways that are kind and fair and just. And you're going to learn in today's lesson about how God wants us to make the best choices because God is just. Today, we're going to take a look at what God is doing in Rwanda. Rwanda is known as the land of a thousand hills. That's because it's full of rolling green foothills that sit 950 meters or more above the sea level. Rwanda is also home to one third of the world's gorillas, as well as elephants, giraffes, and 670 different species of birds. Doesn't that sound like a wild place to live? Let me introduce you to Argentine. Argentine lives with her two younger brothers in the rural area of Rwanda called the Carambo Village. In Rwanda, it can be difficult for families to send their children to school. Often people are forced between choosing to have enough money to eat or to pay fees for their children to go to school. But the good news is that through the Orphans and Vulnerable Children program supported by CBM in her community, Argentina is now able to go to school. She now has a mentor and the help that she needs, not only for school fees, but for school supplies too. You're going to hear more about Argentine from your teacher in today's lesson. This amazing change in Argentine's life was made possible because of generous people who chose to help by giving money and supporting the Orphans and Vulnerable Children program. They could have kept that money for themselves, but instead, when they heard that some kids don't have the opportunity to go to school, they knew that that wasn't okay. It was unjust. So they decided to try and make things right by giving money to help. Did you know that the Lord is a mighty raw and he never does wrong? God can always be trusted to bring justice. That's from Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. It's amazing to think that together with God, you and I can help kids like Argentine go to school. Well, I'm going to hand it, hand it back to your teacher who's going to tell you a little bit more about Argentine's story. But before I do, I want you to remember that God wants to help us make the best choices because God is just. Do you want to say it with me? God wants to help us make the best choices because God is just. That's great. I'll see you next time. Today's scripture is taken from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through to 18. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. 
For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Mission Month at Emmanuel Baptist Church. Wherever you are watching from today, we're glad that you've taken this time to focus on deepening your faith as we reflect on God's word. Today, as I kick off Mission Month, I would like to recognize the theme from the Mission and Outreach team, a generous and overflowing heart. This theme is based on our theme scripture passage from 1 Peter chapter 4. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Today I will be preaching on the title, Good Answers, Good News, as we reflect on how we can be better prepared to share our faith with others with a particular focus on the kinds of questions our youth and young adults are likely to face in this day and age. If you're over the age of 50, some of the points of reference may be a little foreign to you, but don't worry. I trust the, the bigger message of sharing faith will be loud and clear for all. Let's pray. Dear God, as we approach this service today and as we look to your word, we ask that you would open uh, your truth to us and lead us in the way of peace and joy. In Jesus' name, amen. More than 100 years ago, when the telegraph was the most important means of long-distance communication, a young man saw an ad in the newspaper for a Morse code operator. Since he had previous experience, he decided to apply. When he arrived at the office building, he discovered a large, noisy office full of typewriters and telegraph equipment clacking away. A sign at the receptionist counter instructed potential applicants to fill out a form and then wait until they were summoned to enter the inner office for an interview. The young man completed his form and sat down with the seven other applicants who had arrived before him. After a few minutes, he stood up. He crossed the room, entered the door to the inner office, and walked in. Within a few minutes, the young man em emerged, escorted by the boss, who announced to the other applicants, gentlemen, thank you very much for coming, but the job has been filled by Mr. Thompson. The other applicants began to grumble and complain to one another, and one of them spoke up and said, wait a minute. He was the last one to come in, and we never even got a chance to be interviewed. Yet he got the job. That's not fair. The boss smiled and said, of course it's fair. While you've been sitting here waiting, that telegraph machine over there has been clicking out this message. <laughs> Anybody have an idea what this message might be? So the message is, if you understand this message, then come right in. The job is yours. <laughs> now, aside from being an interesting story, this is an illustration about how communication technology changes. The story clearly illustrates how these seven applicants waiting in the interview room missed their opportunity because they had not yet fully adapted to the changing pace of technology in their day. The illustration also highlight, highlighted the rapid pace of communication change in my own experience because I found this illustration in a book that was printed several decades ago. If I had wanted to figure out the message in Morse code 20 years ago, I would have had to travel to a library and find a book on the subject. 10 years ago, I could have searched the internet to find a web page con uh, containing Morse code and how to decipher it. 
But this week, I simply Googled Morse code translator and it came up with this website. Not only did it translate the message into Morse code in less than a second, but it also had a play button so I could hear what it would sound like. <laughs> so any message reflecting on communicating our faith in the 21st century has to start with this recognition. Technology has changed dramatically in the past two decades, and it continues to change at breakneck speed. This service you are watching right now employs technologies that were only a distant dream a few short years ago. Recording and mixing studio quality music in someone's basement, shooting 1080p video using a camera in your phone, editing videos on a laptop in your living room, then uploading and sharing the service to a potential audience of billions of people worldwide. All of this was science fiction just a few short years ago. So, yeah, communication is changing. And every church needs to ask, are we still living in the age of the printing press, the telegraph, or even the World Wide Web in this age of Instagram and TikTok. 1 Peter 3, verse 15. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Now, as interesting as it might be to discuss different media strategies, I'm far more interested today in the content of the message that we have to share. I want us to focus for a few moments on how precisely we can prepare ourselves to give an answer to anyone who asks us to give a reason for the hope that we have in Christ. So let's just start with the context. Just as communication is changing, so too our culture is changing. We live in a culture that is breaking away from its traditional Christian moorings. Western nations, Canada among them, are increasingly moving away from traditional expressions of faith. And one of the fastest growing segments in our society is no religion. That's not to say there aren't healthy, vibrant Christian communities. Not at all. God is still at work, and many people are enjoying the vitality of a life of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, as you are and as I am. But our young people are growing up in a culture that is, at best, ambivalent to the church, and at worst, openly hostile to any form of organized religious belief. And in the past two decades, we've seen a significant increase, particularly in academic circles, of vocal critics who maintain that science and technological advances have somehow made faith in God irrelevant. In fact, many voices would go so far as to say it is impossible to reconcile faith in God with the contemporary sciences, particularly in the areas of astronomy and biology. And sadly, many young people and young adults are poorly equipped to respond to the challenges they will face when they attend college or university. So, faith and science. So how do Christians respond when they're presented with challenges from someone who argues that it's impossible to defend creation from a biblical point of view with all that we know from the natural sciences? If you're like me, you've looked for Christian writers and apologists who are able to defend the doctrine of creation, but most of these debates tend to focus on reconciling the creation narrative of Genesis with contemporary cosmology and biology. And to be perfectly honest, the vast majority of Christians are not sufficiently knowledgeable to be able to do debate effectively based on scientific evidence alone. 
Perhaps more importantly, let's face it, very few people are drawn to faith in Jesus through this kind of debate or the flame wars that we sometimes see in social media. Well, today I'd like to propose a different approach. It doesn't start with the natural sciences, but rather it responds to the natural sciences from a theological foundation. For the following reflection, I am deeply indebted to Dr. Jonathan Wilson and his book, God's Good World, Reclaiming the Doctrine of Creation. Now, if you were to read this book, and I highly recommend it, Dr. Wilson starts out by outlining theology, specifically the theology of the kingdom of God, the theology of the creator, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the theology of the doctrine of creation. Only after establishing these important theological doctrines does he go on to reflect on a number of scientific views that are frequently debated in relationship to creation. So let me just give you one example. Charles Darwin's memorable statement about natural selection, the survival of the fittest. So let me ask you, as a Christian, if you're presented with the survival of the fittest as an argument against creation, how would you respond? What kind of reasonable answer can you give in this situation? Well, let me just give you a quick overview of Dr. Wilson's approach. He writes, as an interpretation of a fallen world, I find this story quite persuasive. Isn't this what Christians would expect of a universe created for good and teleologically intended for life, but turned upside down by our rejection of the world as creation? When we reject this world as God's blessing, gift, and life, then it is an entirely reasonable outcome that we know the world as curse, burden, and death. So Dr. Wilson is effectively saying, why wouldn't the survival of the fittest be one way of describing our fallen world as it currently exists, a place where we see struggle and hardship and death? But then he goes on to encourage us to reflect more deeply at a theological level. He writes, evolutionary accounts of the world accept death as the final horizon and the limit of existence. But the good news of Jesus Christ accepts no such horizon or limit. The good news of creation is that the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is life and gives life to this world as creation. The final horizon and limit is not death, but the new creation, which is neither final horizon nor limit, but it is telos. In this case, the word telos means the, the end or the purpose of creation. So the survival of the fittest describes a world of struggle, suffering, and death which is a fair summary of the world as we know it, but the doctrine of creation leads us to discover that the world, as we experience it, exists in a fallen state, but God is the redeemer, and one day he will fully restore the original perfection of all things in a new creation that has no end. Just listen to these words from Revelation 21. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among his people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Dr. Wilson concludes saying, it turns out then that the survival of the fittest makes sense of the storyline of a fallen world, but leaves us within the prison of sin and death. Only through believing in Christ and thus trusting God in him 
do we enter into the resurrected life of his own faithfulness to the way of creation. Well, I'm thankful for the heavy theological lifting that Dr. Wilson has done in his book. He provides similar reflections on the blind clockmaker, the selfish gene, and and many other relevant topics today. The point that I'm trying to make Uh, this morning is not that we should avoid engaging in conversations about science, but rather it is to advocate for conversations that are rooted in deeper theological reflection. We don't need to argue against the survival of the fittest, but instead we can see it as an opportunity to communicate the dramatic contrast between evolution that is bounded by death and creation that is rooted in life. The theology of creation is not primarily about stars and planets and people. It's primarily about this good world that God created where people can flourish and experience his shalom, his divine blessing and life. And significantly, creation presents us with a universe that was created for a purpose. This is not a random accident without direction or purpose. Creation makes sense out of the puzzling accident of life on planet Earth. And significantly, at a personal level, God's new creation is an invitation to life. It is an opportunity for us to turn from death and experience the new life that is available through Christ Jesus our Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Before the fall of the Iron Curtain, a rabbi was wandering in the woods of Eastern Europe. Meditating on the Torah as he walked through the forest, he lost track of where he was and wandered close to no man's land. This was the thin strip of land separating the east and the west. Soldiers patrolled this area day and night, and anyone who tried to cross over could be shot on sight. Suddenly, the rabbi was confronted by a soldier pointing a rifle at him and demanding, Who are you? Why are you here? The rabbi thought for a very long moment, seemingly unaware of the tension of the moment, And then he looked at the soldier and said, friend, those are very important questions you ask. Please, will you come to my house every day and ask me those questions again? And he turned and walked away as the soldier stood there trying to make sense out of what had just happened. Who are you? Why are you here? You see, here's the fork in the road where the natural sciences run out of things to say because they're not equipped to provide answers to life's meaning and purpose. These are the questions that belong to the realm of metaphysics, of philosophy and religion. And it is in this area that we have the very best answers the world has ever known. Who are you? You are a child of God. You've been born again by God's Spirit. You have been saved from sin and received God's gracious gift of eternal life. You are a new creation. You are no longer standing in sin's condemnation, but now you are alive through the Holy Spirit. And why are you here? You are here to follow Jesus to be in a relationship with God, to exalt and praise God, to grow in the fruit of the Spirit, to play a part in the body of Christ, the church, to serve others, and to tell others the good news. And it is at this point that we have come full circle. We are here to tell others the good news. How? 
We are best equipped to do this when we have a solid grasp of God's word and the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. When I was a teenager, Reader's Digest was found in many homes, and every once in a while I'd pick up a copy and look for something interesting to read. My two favorite features were Laughter is the Best Medicine and Drama in Real Life. I remember one of those drama in real life stories. You know, these were true stories of real life events. This one was called Over the Edge, and it had to do with the Tasman Bridge near the city of Hobart in Australia. On a blustery, rainy night in 1975, a bulk carrier ship was passing under the bridge when it went off course and crashed into one of the bridge piers. Within minutes, the roadway buckled and a large section of the bridge collapsed. Murray and Helen Ling were driving home across the bridge with their children in the back seat when Murray noticed the lights went out ahead of them. At first, he thought it was a blackout, but then he could see the, the city lights of Hobart in the distant shore, and he was confused. So he began to slow his vehicle down. As he was trying to make sense of everything, a car sped by him in the fast lane and then just vanished into the darkness. He slammed on his brakes and came to a stop just a meter from the edge. They sat there in their car trying to figure out what happened to the bridge. When Murray noticed in, in his rearview mirror headlights of a, of a car coming behind them, he quickly ordered his children and his wife to, to get out of the car and move over to the side of the road. And then he got out of the car and ran towards it, trying to wave and, wave and flag down the motorist. The car swerved around him, and seconds later he watched it as it disappeared over the edge. Here's a picture of the scene the next morning. Thanks to the heroic response of people like Murray, disaster was narrowly averted for several vehicles and their occupants. For these people, their lives were literally hanging in the balance. This is such an evocative image, thinking about the people driving across that bridge just as they had done many times before, completely unaware of the dangers ahead. And then I think about myself in the shoes of Murray Ling, standing in the rain, their only hope. What would you do? Would you just stand there with your hands in your pockets? Would you keep quiet? Fearful that someone might react negatively if you tried to pull them over to the side of the road? Or would you do what Murray did? Run into the oncoming traffic, risking your own safety, shouting and, and waving your arms? Wouldn't you do everything in your power to warn them of the dangers that lie just ahead? Jesus said, wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. There are people all around us racing through this life without giving seriously thought to what lies ahead, imagining that the road just goes on and on forever. And for a world that is lost a world where people are anxious and depressed and lacking a sense of meaning or purpose, we've got good news to share. So think about these words from Peter. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. And do this with gentleness and respect. Are you prepared? I hope so. God is counting on us to be his hands, his feet, and his voice in the world. 
I invite you to take a moment to read these words from the book of Romans. Read these words of encouragement and hope and rejoice in the good news that in Christ you have life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today to offer you our praise and worship. We praise you for who you are, for your majesty, and for your unmatched glory. We are grateful for your unbounded grace and unconditional mercy, for loving us beyond what we can even imagine. Father, during this Lent season, we are reminded again of our sinfulness and of our need for redemption. We come to you with deep gratitude for the cross and for the resurrected life. 
for cleansing us of our sins and for giving our trespasses. As we remember, we offer you our whole lives again. We relinquish all control of our lives and give you the lordship and sovereignty over our whole lives. God, uh, we live in a troubled world, especially this last year. In Lebanon, we face trauma after trauma and crisis after crisis. In the middle of all of this hardship, we are experiencing your delivering love and provisions. We are grateful for your church and the way you are working through it to bring hope and meaning to a hopeless world. We pray for our local churches, that they continue to be the salt and light that you call them to be, that they would continue to proclaim your love and deliverance in word and deed. We are also grateful for the work that you are doing through CBM's partners all over the globe. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to participate in your vast work in this needy world. We pray for strength, wisdom, resilience, and bold witness for all our CBM staff and partners. We pray that you keep us faithful in participating in your mission in the world. Strengthen us, Father. Teach us to do your will. Give us pure minds and hearts. Protect us from our own sinfulness. Comfort us when we are disturbed and disturb us when we are too comfortable. We love you, we praise you, and we give you all glory. Amen. We come to the Lord's Supper together as children of our one God. Jesus makes the guest list, not us. Our family chosen by God is gathered from west and east and includes everyone, even the lowest and the least. Jesus, after he was resurrected from the dead, revealed himself to his disciples in the breaking of bread around a table. May we see the face of God together today as we come to the Lord's table. We read in scripture that on the night he was handed over, the night before he was crucified, Jesus gathered with his friends for a meal. He took bread and after blessing it, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. As often as you eat it, remember me. Please pray with me. Jesus, we take this bread. Let it be a sign of all you did for us and who you are for us. Thank you for this bread of life. Amen. Take, eat in remembrance of him. After sharing the bread, Jesus took a cup of wine and gave it to them to drink, saying, This is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. Let us pray. Jesus, as we drink this cup, let it be a sign for us of all you did for us and who you are for us. Thank you that you bring us peace that passes understanding. Amen. Take, drink in remembrance of him. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, through your death and resurrection, you reconciled the world to God. And through your example, you have shown us a way to peace. Give us strength as the people of God to be channels of peace in the world, speaking your peace, living your peace, and always longing for that moment of eternal peace when we shall see you face to face. 
We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, my name is Henry Chu. I'm the Director of Development and Marketing at North York Harvest Food Bank. On behalf of the thousands who come to our network for emergency food, I want to thank Emmanuel Baptist Church for your continued support. Emmanuel Baptist Church has been a wonderful partner for so many years. And within our network, we have agencies operated just around the corner from you, down at Oreo Community Center, which uh, over the years, you have helped sustain. Since the start of the pandemic 13 months ago, we have seen a huge surge in the number of people who require our support. And at the same time, our capacity to deliver service was significantly reduced because of forced closures. Many of our member agencies were located either in public spaces or they were operated by volunteers. As a result, they had to stop their service. So to accommodate the increased demand, many of our open agencies were forced to work longer hours. We were forced to uh, uh, deliver uh, our change our operation to ensure that we can deliver uh, food hampers to the families. And in fact, in 2020, oh, more than 3 million pounds of food came through North York Harvest compared to only 2 million pounds the year before. In total, 228,000 people were served during 2020. Now, we could not have done that without your sub support. So on behalf of everyone in the North York Harvest community, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you for providing the funding. I wanna thank you for doing the many food drives. And equally important, I wanna thank you for your continued support because your support you're also encouraging us, our frontline staff, letting them know that they're not out there on their own. You're, lot, you're letting our clients know that even though they're going through this very, very difficult time with the pandemic as well as with their financial situation, there is somebody out there are thinking of them, a lending a helping hand. And for that, I thank you. Morning, Emmanuel. We appreciate and are so thankful for your faithfulness in tithing and supporting our missionaries and ministries here at Emmanuel. There are several ways to send in offerings. You can donate online at emmanuelbaptist.ca. Check out our website for more information on how to do that. You can also drop off your offering at the church in the mail slot, or you can send it in the mail as well. Hebrews 13 verse 16 says this, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Join me as I pray for our offering. God, we pray that you would bless our missionaries and ministries at Emmanuel. We pray that you would support us and provide for all of our needs as a community. We pray that you would bless us and keep us healthy and strong and protect us from everything that's going on. God, we pray that we'll be able to be a hope and a light to our neighborhood and the world. Thank you for everything that you've done for us. Bless our tithes and offerings today. In your name we pray. Amen. Bye!
Morning, Emmanuel. We are so happy that you joined us today. These are our opportunities for this Sunday. May is Mission Month. You'll be sharing reports from various missionaries and ministries that are supported by Emmanuel. Our theme is a generous and overflowing heart based on the scripture passage of 1 Peter 4 verses 8 through 10. On May 23rd, we'll be welcoming Brent Ostring as our guest speaker. Also, on May 16th, after the service, we'll be having our semi-annual business meeting. This is an important meeting for members of the church to elect officers for the upcoming year. Since we do not have a notice board to post the list of nominees nominated by the committee, we will be including the list in our e-news along with the link to the full list of officers and nominees online. If you do not receive the e-news and you would like a copy of this list of nominees, please contact the office for more information and that will be passed along to you quickly and soon as possible. Invitations to join this virtual meeting on Zoom will be going out to all active members on Friday, May 14th. We would also like to congratulate Brandon and Drad and Deanna Elder on getting married yesterday. We pray and wish you all the best in this next chapter of life. This is our benediction for the, today. May the love of God be the passion in your heart. May the joy of God your strength when times are hard. May the presence of God a peace that overflows. May the word of God, the seed that you might sow. Bye! Oh.